if you didn't think of those things as you parse through the intro and the discussion, that's okay. Uh, this is, again, a skill that comes with time and practice. We're going to leave uh, to uh, now explore the second component of the paper anatomy, which is the overall experimental design and the materials and methods. Um, we're going to look for limitations um, in them. Now, every scientist makes what I have in parentheses here, choices. There are a lot of variables uh, in any experiment, especially in one like this where we have humans involved and all sorts of environmental factors to consider. So when you're setting up your experiment, as I mentioned in the first video, it's very important to define your parameters, establish your controls, so that you know when and where you can trust your data and make an important inference from your data to know what those results are suggesting towards what you're studying overall. The scientists performing the work at the bench after the design is completed make choices as well in terms of how much they're pipetting or if they don't see a result, how to troubleshoot it. Maybe there was some user error, maybe there was some mechanical error. How do you figure that out and how do you move forward? We make choices. Those choices can limit us, and that's both good and bad. We have to live within the limitations of our choices. We have to limit, uh, live within the limitations of our models, even the mouse models that I just talked about a moment ago. So the most we can do is establish a very, very well-controlled study and perform well-controlled experiments. That's our job as a scientist, and we're going to learn how to do that later on in the semester. So let's move to the materials and methods, and I'm going to start right there with the very, very first uh, portion of it. And the materials and methods on the second column of that last page there start with population enrollment. Ah, something I love, fecal sample collection, mm, and DNA extraction. So these are the very, very first steps in sort of conceptualizing this work, um, establishing how the poop was going to be collected, and of course the poop is where you find the gut microbes, and um, how the DNA was going to be extracted from those poop samples, the DNA of the microbes, so that they can be identified for the bacteria species that we learned about in this paper. Reading right off the top, it says, we en enrolled 15 healthy children living in the rural village of Bullpon district of Nanoro, and I'm going to pause right there, not because I'm struggling to read those words, but because of the number 15. You may have noticed that on the very, very first page of this paper, under the section marked Results and Discussion, the very first section is called Characterization of Dietary Habits of Children from this area. I'll read that first sentence to you. It says, in this study, we characterized the fecal microbiota of 14 healthy children from the Mazi ethnic group, BF, for short. And then it goes on to say, and 15 from healthy European donors. So that right there is a discrepancy. Um, this says in the me methods 15 healthy children um, from this group when actually it's in four it was 14. We know it was 14 um, based on some other um, evidence, and I'm going to go through that with you right here. And so hopefully this is just a typo, but your spidey senses might have been alerted if you looked at the methods and saw, hmm, that doesn't match. This is not correct. So hopefully this was just a typo. Um, it says that you can look at table S1 for some more information. Um, and I'm wondering if you uh, actually clicked on the supplemental materials Table S1, where the S stands for supplement, can be found in those supplemental materials. And so you've had the PDF of this um, through the Canvas platform. And if you scroll down there, there's a link. And if you click on that link, you can see all the supplemental materials. Those include an expanded methods and some tables that further explain the, the, um, the patient donors from both groups, as well as the diet and other environmental conditions. So let me show you that. Here is table S1, which I've copied from the supplement and put right here for you. And on the left column, you see ID. And so they've given an anonymous number 
to each donor from both groups, BF and EU, designating the different areas, um, Burkina Faso and Tuscany, Italy. So if you were worried about that discrepancy and you wanted to uh, make sure that you had the right number, this is one place to find it. And so, as you can see, there are 14 BF samples listed in the chart and 15 from the European group. Therefore, we do think this, plus uh, 29 being the number of total donors indicated further on in the text and in the figure legends, etc., uh, we're okay assuming uh, the, that it was just a typo there in the methods and that um, everything was 14 BF and 15 EU samples in this particular study. What's more interesting to think about is the last two columns. Uh, in one, the route of delivery, and two, the number of months without antibiotics. And it's fantastic that you have this data here, but it certainly does pose a limitation, and they acknowledge it as such when they're saying that we can't definitively uh, uh, go to causation, that there's other variables at play here potentially. And these are definitely two of them. So we know now, through the wonderful world of microbiology in, in um, uh, primary literature, that the route of delivery affects the microbial composition that you get early in life, um, whether you're born naturally or via cesarean. And you do see a couple of instances here where children were born by a cesarean. We know that breast milk and breastfeeding and the amount of breastfeeding uh, one gets to uh, change that. And so there are some differences uh, between donors and, and that as well. And then of course antibiotics. And so this is a significant one in that the BF samples never were exposed to it. And the EU were, or at least for some period of time. And so these are very important limitations to, to make you think that there's potentially more than just diet at play when it comes to characterizing the microbiota from these groups. So there's a lot to dig in here uh, into, and uh, we might get into some more of these things in class. Doing great. Let's move on to the next section of the materials and methods. And again, we're not going to get into every single one, but I'm going to give you a few because we're again thinking about limitations based on choices. So this is 16S sequencing for our RNA gene applicons. And so this is a very, very important choice. And in the world of sequencing, we are trying to determine identity. And there's two ways we could do that predominantly for microbes. One is to look at this 16S region. 16S is an indicator for something that all microbes have. And this particular region contains both conserved regions that are similar for every microbe, and then variable regions that make each microbe unique. And we could use to sequence and tell who's who. They're kind of like the barcoding regions of the 16S. And so that's what they mean by V um, in this sentence. V stands for variable, and that's what 16S is. Um, where we're focusing on the 16S RNA region. And so I'm going to put those in boxes right here. The V5 and V6 hypervariable region. It just so happens that there are nine variable regions within the 16S region, and they're only going to look at two of them, V5 and V6. Now there's reason for that, and that's because a lot of the gut microbes fall within those two regions, 5 and 6, for their barcoding abilities. However, we're also excluding then bacteria that would be sequenced if we had probed, say, variable regions one and two. We're not going to come up with those, and maybe those are actually key um, uh, species that uh, in, are, are, are determining differences between these two diet groups, but we just wouldn't recover them. Same if uh, um, the key differences were actually in variable regions seven or eight we're not going to find those because the authors chose to focus on simply these two regions for their sequencing, V5 and V6. And so that's a limitation. It's based on good data, but it is nonetheless. Now this paper was published in 2010, and fast forward now to today, and there are another way you could actually um, do the sequencing analysis 
for microbes and uh, particularly for bacteria and that is to do a whole genome approach by something called shotgun sequencing. The main difference is between uh, uh, the 16S and the, and the shotgun is that in the 16S approach we're again targeting barcoded regions within uh, one part of the bacteria chromosome and in this case it was even further down the rabbit hole targeting V5 and V6, just those two regions. Shotgun sequencing um, chops up the whole genome and looks at all the DNA and therefore would include all of those variable regions and other uh, regions of the chromosome too and with the added bon uh, bonus of potentially giving us some predictors of gene function. So this is an advanced tech, uh, technology. Um, both of these um, have uh, strengths and weaknesses associated with each. Um, but you know what, that's for another class. But I just wanted to give you guys a heads up as to uh, how the study was done and that this represented an important choice. That then leads to um, um, some limitations in what you see. Now here's where that plays out a bit for you. And I'm going to actually, even though um, I'm still focusing on the methods, I want to I look forward a little bit into the results. And, and really it's hard to separate the two. So the choice of methods um, and limitations in design certainly affect the results. And here, here is that example then playing out for you, where um, the v, V5 and V6 sequencing decision um, affects the depth of what you see when you're looking at the composition of microbiota between the two groups. And so right here is figure one, and I, I actually copied this over from the paper and put um, 1A side by side with 1B. And I'm going to indicate to you, by showing this doubled arrow line, that our resolution of sequencing only gets us to the phylum and genus levels here um, for the bacteria of interest. And so we don't actually get to species. I don't see anything beyond uh, Prevotella, for example, as, as the genre, um, or uh, Bacteroides or uh, Rosebraria. These are some of the example genre. The phylum level is uh, the Bacteroides and the Firmicutes. So we can't see anything more depthful. For example, on the right in 1B uh, in the uh, EU group, it says um, Bacteroides, the second one down after Alice, Alice types. The Bacteroides genus contains a lot of species. Um, that may or may not inhabit your gut. And one of those is Bacteroides fragilis, which I always abbreviate in my teachings as BF, your best friend. It's just one of those bacteria that we know to now mechanistically train your immune system, keep inflammation low, and keep you healthy. Uh, you want to have that BF. We also know that not all BF are the same. And so there are also differences between genus, species, and then strain. So Bacteroides fragilis strain one, or Bacteroides fragilis strain two. And the difference between strains would be at the genetic level. And there's very important differences that potentially play out in composition of gut microbiota in humans. And so if all we get is to the depth of the, gen the genre here, and we don't even have the species, then we definitely don't know anything about the particular strains these people might have. And it's important because not all Bacteroides fragilis are the same. Come out to your skin. Not all Staph aureus are the same. There are different strains that live on your skin. In fact, in any given community of organisms in any given location, whether that's skin, gut, or soil, we can't assume that every single cell of a particular genus and species are exactly the same strain. So it's true that the shotgun approach would have gotten us a little bit closer, a little bit more depthful towards strains, but again there's limitations and so um, we're not just going to make that blanket statement just yet. Um, let's go down further then in the methods to the next section, quantifying and comparing diversity between BF and EU populations. And I really want to point this one out because it will be very consistent with things you've heard before in this class. Um, right off the bat. How do they analyze their data? Well, differences between populations have been analyzed using parametric ANOVA and something called non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis tests. Okay, 
ANOVA is something we focused on, and um, I hope that's gotten your uh, juices refreshed. There are a couple of quiz questions this week asking you to draw back on your material and your knowledge from that particular week. Um, for example, you're starting to think about normal and non-normal distribution and whether or not this matters at all, right? Yeah, sure you are. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see you nodding. I, I know, I know. That's good. So that's one component of it. Later on, um, they indicate that the non-parametric rank-driven Kruskal-Wallis test was uh, a preferred for some things. And uh, it says, which performs well in absence of distributional, distributional assumptions. So we're going to explain some of these things um, in class. And there's actually a piece of your homework that asks you to look into this further, not just that quiz question. But these are important decisions. These are important choices based on the data they have and uh, why, they, why they actually chose to use these. And so what we're hoping now is that you're really starting to feel comfortable if we kind of think back to what this class has been to this point as we're almost near the halfway point. So we've done uh, data visualization. We've done um, organization of it. We uh, then analyze that data via different statistical methods. And now we're, we're, we went, went to ANOVA. This reading of the paper and analyzing of the paper is also pulling in those lessons. As you can see, scientists making choices and publishing their work based on uh, how their data um, uh, is indicating they need to do that. Okay, so you're doing a great job and we've crossed off two of the sections. Let's move to the third and that would of course be the results. Again, we haven't hit them all, um, but that's going to be part of our class exercise this week. I'm going to actually go ahead and fast forward to figure three. And I've got here the um, figure legend for the entire figure short chain fatty acid producing bacteria could help to prevent establishment of some potentially pathogenic intestinal bacteria. And I have part A illustrated for you here. And so what you see is on the y-axis short chain fatty acids in fecal samples given to you as a, a particular concentration micromolar per gram you have a black set of bars and a gray set of bars where uh, those colors differentiate the diet groups, black being the BF and gray being the EU. And then you can see comparisons for, on the x-axis, total short-chain fatty acids, or each of them the four individual ones that follow, acetic, propionic, butyric, and val valeric. As you can tell, by the asterisks, cisses, asterisks, cisses. I actually don't know. I always, I always biff on that uh, uh, pluralization of asterisks. Say it how you like. Um, there's either three or two, but in any case, you can see at the bottom that the p-values, based on one-tailed student t-tests, all fall in significant ranges. Where um, in this case, you've got two or three in figure 3a are all either less than or equal to 0.01 or 0 0.001 depending on if it's 2 or 3 respectively. That's interesting. One of the things I've taught you in the first video to think about is looking for sentences or statements in the results that don't quite match the actual figures. This happens to be one of those times. And so here is the text from the uh, page that follows the figure where the graph is actually being referenced. And so I'm going to box this part right here. Um, it says, whereas acetic and valeric acids were comparable in both groups. Let's read that whole sentence. In particular, Propionic acid and butyric acids are nearly four times more abundant in BF than in EU fecal samples, whereas acetic and valeric acids were comparable in both groups. That word comparable suggests that they're the same and that they wouldn't be significantly different. However, if you look at the graph for both acetic and valeric, you do see that the diet groups are differentiated by 
asterisks that indicate statistical significance. So this actually doesn't quite line up, and this would be a uh, experimental uh, critique related to um, the results as written. As a quick aside, related to bar graphs and showing data in that representation, um, and we've talked about data visualization, I'm, I'm giving you a reference here at the bottom, that's the DOI number for a paper, um, and this is a really, really nice paper that actually looked at how um, particular probiotics protected against uh, vibrio cholera infection in the gut. And the reason I like this presentation better than bar graphs, which they could have absolutely given you, is that you see all the individual data points and their distribution within each group. So on the x-axis, you see V, which is how much Vibrio you'd get. And uh, the second group, uh, V plus L, is how much Vibrio you'd get if Vibrio and a probiotic marked L were added together. So there's obviously a significant difference between uh, the blue and red groupings. Um, the line indicates the average for each uh, of these uh, sets. And so not only can you count the number of data points in each, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for blue, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for red, that's consistent. Our n is the same. And of course, looking at sample size and consistency between sample size is certainly something we're thinking about, as mentioned in video one. This is really nice because it gives you the entire distribution. And you can see, for example, where some uh, data points overlap with other data sets. So look at those two red ones overlapping with some of the, including the average uh, values in the Vibrio group on the left, or the blue ones. And that's nice to see sort of that biological variation and have an appreciation for that. It's not simply all or one, all or nothing. You have some data points that do indeed overlap between groups for especially things like, in this case, uh, a mouse study where each of those circles is a different mouse. There's a lot of biological variation to consider. So it's nice to see it represented. So here's an example where it's hard to tell whether or not the um, sentence as written and the results as given are in alignment with each other. Where we're going to look is right above figure three. We're going to go to the bottom of that left column just above it. And I'm going to blow that up for you here as indicated by the arrow. We're going to focus in on the section that says microbial richness and biodiversity. So that we then compared the richness as estimated by the COW1 index and the biodiversity assessed by a non-parametric Shannon index for the two BF and EU groups. In our calculations, we took into account different OTU distances. Fantastic. And then it says, using the non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis test for comparisons, we found significant differences, I'm going to blow that up for you, in both richness and biodiversity between these two groups. The question is, is that actually what the data does show you? When you look at this S6, it's a bit hard to really see what's happening. Um, I'm not going to put the box plots from figure S3 that do show the um, Shannon indices generated from non-parametric analysis. The thing that's confusing is that when you look at this table, which doesn't reference in the text NP Shannon indexes, they, they just refer to those in figure S3, you see in the last three columns NP Shannons with p-values that are not significant. So it's very hard to reconcile then sort of this discrepancy between those two things. And sometimes you see that, and um, there's uh, valid reasons for this, but we can't really make that determination given the two different presentations of those data sets. All right, so let's take a deep breath. That concludes the analysis of this particular paper portion of the video. We didn't analyze every bit. We've left some for class, and we've also left some for you to think about uh, in your written work uh, for the homework component, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Our main hope is that at this point you feel much more confident with the article and have learned some ways to parse through a scientific manuscript to make it feel a little more accessible and not as scary, which it may have uh, when you first picked up this article. I remember uh, feeling that way, and I still do. Reading science is challenging, and so learning 
the formula for how to think about it and how to make your own determination of what to think about these results is so important. That's it's really uh, a, a to me one of the most important things you could do uh, with your bachelor's degree is is learn how to be a critical thinker in all contexts, and of course this being one of them. And so you can kind of ask yourself, did you enjoy that process? Did you enjoy sleuthing for clues through an article, seeing how the scientific method was employed, how all of the elements of experimental design came to be? Because if so, uh, you should approach one of your instructors and we can discuss with you some uh, opportunities uh, that you might be able to take part in during your undergraduate or even uh, point you towards some uh, postgraduate opportunities, whether those be graduate programs or jobs, so that you can use these skills and, and continue to learn more about them to see if this is something you might want to do for your career. And having said that, um, I want to uh, give you some overview on uh, this week's uh, writing assignments for both the homework and the discussion we're going to have in class. And this is kind of then going towards now putting it back together. We spent some time looking at all the puzzle pieces up until this point. And now we want to put those puzzle pieces together. Um, we're going to synthesize all this together by summation. And we're going to do this in three different ways. You've already now in class been tasked with writing the abstract for the article. And that was a, a challenging thing, no doubt. So that was one form. And so we're going to build on that. Um, but we're going to ask you to do uh, these three things. The first is to create a short, abbreviated, written um, synopsis, let's say, of the whole paper. And we want you to do so for a scientific audience. The goal here is to, in just a couple of short sentences, in your own words, be able to convey the main findings and the main significance. So the main findings and the main significance uh, for this article as if you were writing to fellow scientists. Learning how to condense an entire story into a couple of short sentences is a very, very important skill that all of us scientists must learn. Uh, and it applies to many situations that you might not be thinking about. Like for example, um, someone might ask you at some point, well, what do you study when you're doing undergraduate research? And you don't have a lot of time and you don't want to go on and on. So learning how to, to briefly describe um, sort of like an elevator pitch version of your work is key for a lot of different places. And so um, we're going to do this um, uh, in the first part. And there's more directions for this um, on the Canvas platform. The second component is taking the uh, scientific audience synthesis you did, um, conveying those main findings and, and biological significance of the story again, but in this uh, instance for a lay audience. And this is really challenging. This might sound like it's the easy part of the assignment, but actually this is really hard. And so we're going to give you a link online to a, a database of the most commonly used words uh, I think it's the 10 hundred most commonly used words in the English language. And you're going to copy paste your writing in here and check to see if you have uh, a version that fits within these words. So we're going to have a very strict word ca um, a category so that you are learning how to discuss the findings of the paper with someone who might not be a scientist, might not be a biologist. I think this is one of the most important jobs of a biologist, and that being to share your knowledge with people who might not be as uh, lucky as you to be earning a bachelor's degree in this field, and so that they understand the world around them as much as you do at such an advanced level. This requires us to change the way we speak a little bit. We've spent so much time in this class learning the scientific language for reading and writing, and that's great. That's going to be your job and your career. But it's a very different thing then, of course, from how we would communicate this maybe with friends or family who just aren't in this field of study. And look how hard it was to, to learn all this. So people who haven't then um, are relying on you to provide them this information. And just as a quick little related note, if we don't 
as biologists and scientists more broadly, talk to the public about what we're doing and why it's important, then we're going to continue to struggle with a lot of things like antibiotic resistance and, and people understanding and appreciating why and how we can, we can tackle this problem. The majority of scientific funding to, to uh, um, um, uh, put instruments and people in labs and do research is funded by taxpayers, the general public. And so we have to convince them that this is important, show them why they should care, um, and, and, and help them realize what we're doing so, so that they do have an appreciation uh, at that level. So we're going to have you write a lay audience summary, and uh, that actually is going to be harder than you think. And I actually very, very much encourage you this week um, when you're doing this is to um, write the scientific summary and write the lay audience summary and then read them to your roommates, your family, your friends, your BFs, your GFs, all, all, all the people around you, and, and get some feedback and see what they say. Um, see how much they understand of the scientific one, and, and then if they totally get it when you uh, flip over to the lay one, that would be fantastic. The third way we're going to have you uh, synthesize is by making what's called a graphical abstract. And I'm going to explain that in the next slide. And this is actually becoming a more and more commonly used format for journals. They're going to publish a scientific manuscript, and alongside it is going to be a graphical summary of the article. So this is to summarize the article in, in a visual way. And basically what you can think about is taking your abstract that you wrote and putting it down and then side by side bringing it to life through graphics and and we're gonna give you some options for how to do this you can hand draw it in color you could use a uh, Adobe Illustrator program you could use Microsoft PowerPoint examples are, are coming here in just the next slide um, but this is a really really effective way I'm a visual learner um, I usually don't understand anything until I see it um, drawn or, or especially when we're talking about mechanisms uh, having you know this lead to this with an arrow and then how does this get to the big picture um, that's what we're gonna have you guys do each of these three things so I'm gonna go uh, in the ne next slide here about uh, more information for graphical abstracts okay so behold an example and again I've given you the reference down at the bottom with the DOI value of a graphical abstract as a means of scientific synthesis and communication. And, you know, one of the reasons we want to have you do all of these different components of the scientific process throughout this class, including this one, is so that you begin to realize strengths you may have and weaknesses. And we want you to go uh, uh, follow up on your strengths um, and as indicators of potential career paths that any of these individual skill sets involved in science might uh, um, uh, be exciting for you to try. And then for the weaknesses, to help you uh, identify areas of, uh, of need of improvement and potentially ways um, of you filtering out things that you don't enjoy doing as a ways of eliminating potential career paths. Science is not a one-size-fits-all career. It's not all lab bench. It's not all healthcare. There are so many things you could do. Um, this actually plays right into something called science illustration. And I love this because many journals now, and we learned about peer review and journal uh, publication in the last video, many of these journals are now requiring scientists to publish a graphical representation of their story, a graphical synthesis. And some journals even have staff now to help with this. And, and um, you've seen some good graphical representations in, in textbooks and through Google image searching of a concept, uh, concept. In fact, as a little side tip, the journal Nature Reviews, which is a review uh, um, article, uh, not a uh, primary literature article, but those, those review articles uh, come with several beautiful uh, graphical synthesis figures of different mechanisms and concepts. And so as a student, um, one of the little study tips I recommend is when you get stuck on a concept, go to Google, enter that concept, and then type in the word nature reviews after it. So concept and nature and reviews, and then do an image search. 
and see if you can get a really nice synthesis summary figure to help your studying. Because I was a visual learner and I actually really enjoyed visually presenting data and you might be too. And you might not have even known about these tools. Here is one such version. This actually came in a complex, super, super challenging article that was very mechanistic in nature from the journal Cell, Host, and Microbe. And this was published uh, earlier this year. And um, it shows you sort of the whole mechanism. Um, it, this is actually um, a story about the skin and the bacteria you're going to find on the skin and how vitamin A um, has a big role in sort of uh, how the resident microbiota, not of the gut, but of the skin, sort of uh, takes shape, and then how it may or may not lead to um, uh, pathogenic infections, in this case of streptococcus. It was a really, really nice story. Um, this is such a really nice way when you follow the arrows of, of learning about a story. And in fact, every nice graphical abstract comes with a series of descriptive bullets that um, go with the story. And I'm not going to read through these here, but the important thing is, is that you could um, essentially draw a line from any of those bulleted words over to any of the lines and pictures on the left and um, paint a complete picture of the individual findings on the right and how they led to the big picture on the left. And, and that's just such a nice way to put things together. Um, so again, you see each of the individual findings, each of the pieces of the mechanism described out on the right, and then put together on the left. And, and it's definitely okay if uh, you, you, you're not following exactly what those findings are. That's really not the point. Um, the point is to show you how this looks and how it works, um, as you are going to be asked to create a graphical abstract for this particular paper, where we want you to um, create a summative cartoon or drawing, and then um, create some summary bullets uh, or highlights that go with it to explain your drawing. And uh, uh, more, more um, uh, depthful directions will be uh, found for this um, within the assignment section here. So the second example, and the last one I'm going to give you, is also from the journal Cell Host and Microbe, and you can again see the reference down there, and this was published very recently here. Um, and it involves the uh, bacterial microbiota, um, and you see a person doubled over in pain, and then a blow up there of their intestine, and you can see this is also a story about uh, regional differences, um, here focusing on Bangladesh. And within there, you see that these two bacteria um, are being what's called differentially affected by bacteriophages. And that is quite okay if you have no idea what I just said. I wanted to show you this because of the inherent similarities to what we're, we're, we're doing, um, but also to show you that sometimes um, graphical abstracts are accompanied by longer summaries, which almost look like a written abstract. And so again, the goal of your assignment is going to be to put your written abstract that you wrote on a screen or, or paper and then make it come to life in a drawing form and then for you to create summary bullets um, for the synthesis part like in the previous example on the last slide. You can hand draw, you can color and hand draw, you could use PowerPoint, you could use Adobe Photoshop, you can let your imagination and creativity run wild. Um, you can draw and take a picture and upload it for the assignment. Um, whatever you want to do um, works for us. Um, or create little cartoons in, again, any um, electronic software of your choice. This actually concludes the uh, video for the depthful analysis of the article that was assigned to you this week. And uh, I hope this helped sort of get you thinking, get your juices flowing of where to look and how to look and then to be able to go find some examples of your own as you kind of sleuth through uh, the clues. Uh, and we'll see you in class soon. Thanks again for your uh, continued attention and participation.